This hour, the podcast is exclusively sponsored by my good friends at Advantage Gold. Advantage Gold is a five-star rated gold company with one-of-a-kind customer service. And when it comes to gold and precious metals, Advantage Gold is the only company I'll work with. Call Advantage Gold today and make sure you let them know that Mark Levin sent you. And now, let's begin. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Mark Levin here, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. I'm going to discuss something nobody discusses. A million simulations show that the debt in the United States is on an unsustainable path. U.S. national debt is on unsustainable course simulations show this is Fox Business. Wow, what does all that mean? What does that mean, unsustainable path? Well, what it means is we're going to have a depression. Inflation, stagnation, then inflation. Now let's, let's dig into this. The United States is almost certainly on an unsustainable path with regard to the astronomic rise in its national debt, according to a million simulations run by Bloomberg. A million computer simulations. Wow. Bloomberg reported that it conducted a million simulations on the U.S. debt outlook and found 88% of them borrowing is an un- on an unsustainable path. And the findings come after a forecast by the Congressional Budget Office that indicates the national debt will grow to an astounding $54 trillion in the next decade, next 10 years. It's at $34 trillion right now. The result of an aging population, rising federal health care costs, that's not why. Because these, these politicians spend like drunken Marxists. That's why. Payments are expected to triple from nearly $475 billion in fiscal 2022 to a stunning $1.4 trillion in 2032. That's interest. That's payment for interest. In eight years, $1.4 trillion. By 2053, 30 years from now, the interest payments are projected to surge to $5.4 trillion. To put it into perspective... That'll be more than the U.S. spends on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all other mandatory and discretionary spending programs combined. Combined. When factoring in the market's current outlook and interest rates, the debt-to-GDP ratio is expected to rise to 123% in 2034. Now, what does that mean? The debt to all the gross domestic product, that is, all goods and services produced. The debt to GDP ratio means for every dollar that we produce in this country, we will owe the government a dollar and 23 cents in eight years. And yet, they write, that's a fairly optimistic 
outlook, given the assumption in Washington that the sweeping tax law passed in 2017 by former President Trump will likely be extended. Notice how they always twist it. Notice the problem is always that they don't tax us enough and you don't get to keep enough of your money. The problem is that they spend too damn much. Now, in a higher simulation scenario, the debt-to-GDP burden could be as high as 134% in 2034, 185% in 2050. So that would mean in 26 short years, for every dollar that we the people produce in goods and services, we will owe the government a dollar and 85 cents. Should the debt materialize, it could risk America's economic standing in the world. Are they out of their minds? Should the debt materialize, you're going to need a wheelbarrow to move your money around. I'd like to always take these issues deeper. We sit here, we wring our hands, we shake our heads, and then I say to myself, But do the majority of the American people, but certainly a majority of the ruling class does not, do they really give a damn about anything but today? Bernie Sanders, that's all he's about. Joe Biden, that's all they're about. What about tomorrow? What about our kids and grandkids and generations yet born? So I raise this question. You may have heard of this book, Plunder and Deceit, when I wrote this many years ago. Can we simultaneously love our children but betray their generation and generations yet born? Because that's what we're doing. Among the least acknowledged facts of American modernity is the extent to which parents acting in their familial capacity naturally and tenaciously guard their young children from threat and peril to the point of risking their own physical and economic security in extreme cases. However, as part of the political and governing community, in other words, as the aggregate, that is, the ruling generation is what I call it, many of these same parents wittingly and unwittingly join with other parents in tolerating, if not enthusiastically championing, disadvantageous and even grievous public policies that jeopardize not only their children's future, but the welfare of successive generations. This is why I cannot stand the left. I cannot stand them because this is what they're doing. To be clear, not all parental decisions are impactful or consequential in the lives of children. Obviously, not all decisions are equal. Indeed, the most attentive and nurturing parents are not and cannot be conscious of every decision they make, and as much as the totality of such decisions is likely incalculable, even on a weekly or monthly basis. And in the healthiest families, the most considered parental decisions based on seemingly prudential judgments can and do produce unintended consequences. Of course, the same can be said of decisions about public policy and governing in a relatively well-functioning community. But there are accepted norms of behavior, a moral order, born of experience and knowledge, instinct and faith, teaching and reason and love and passion that provide definition for and boundaries between right and wrong, good and evil, and fairness and injustice applicable to families and societies alike. Hence a harmony of virtuous interest informed by tried and true traditions, customs, values, and institutions and cultivated within families and the larger community preserves and improves the human condition, one individual at a time, one generation to the next, Broadly speaking, this is called the civil society. The civil society. Edmund Burke, a political thinker, was born in Ireland and moved to England where he became a prominent statesman in the 18th century. He explained that the civil society relies on an intergenerational continuum of the past, the living, and the unborn. He wrote that as the end of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations... It becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are dead and those who are yet to be born. In fact, Burke went further, warning that those who forsake this intergenerational continuum condemn themselves, their children, and future generations to a grim existence. He said, one of the first and most leading principles on which the commonwealth and the laws are consecrated is 
lest the temporary possessors and life renters in it, unmindful of what they have received from their ancestors or what is due to their posterity, should act as if they were the entire masters, that they should not think it among their rights to cut off the entail or commit waste on the inheritance by destroying at their pleasure the whole original fabric of society. Hazarding to leave to those who come after them a ruin instead of a habitation. And teaching these successors as little to respect their contrivances as they had themselves respected the institutions of their forefathers. Genius. Absolute genius. And this is what's happening in America. History confirms Burke's observation to embrace the moral order as parents nurturing their children, yet to abandon the moral order as members of the ruling generation, thereby contributing to predictably deleterious public policies with prospectively calamitous outcomes is a decadence that leads to unstable and potentially oppressive or even tyrannical conditions, which in the end degrade and dissemble the civil society and consume their children's generation and generations beyond. Reformation and recovery may be possible, but difficult and complicated, and typically only after the exaction of an enormous human toll. Tell me, how many people write like this? I'm just saying, Mr. Producer. I'm in a different world, a different mindset when I sit down and write. I just am. Burke's commentary was motivated by his reflections on the decade-long French Revolution, his revulsion at the anarchy and horror it unleashed. And in the ensuing more than two centuries, and up to this very moment, the world has witnessed much worse. This is not to say that all instances of civil and societal dislocation take the form of bloody revolution or civil war. Obviously, there are varying pathologies peculiar to particular doctrines, cultures, governing systems, and so on. There are also differing events and circumstances, some building over time and others descending more abruptly. They contribute to the character of the discontinuity. But violence is the ultimate exposure. Violence is the ultimate exposure. When an economy collapses, you had a little, little taste of it during the pandemic. The culture, the society follow. I can't think of a single instance in where that wasn't the case. Even, even in our country, the Great Depression, our country changed forever. And for the worse. Before Burke, Charles de Montesquieu, a French philosopher whose life predated the American Revolution, but who was hugely influential in the Constitution's framers. He also wrote of the Disastrous aftermath of the civil society's abandonment. He explained, when that virtue ceases, this is important, folks, when that virtue ceases, ambition enters those hearts, they can admit it, and avarice enters them all. Desires change their objects. That which one used to love, one loves no longer. One was free under the laws, one wants to be free against them. Each citizen is like a slave who has escaped from his master's house. What was a maxim is now called severity. What was a rule is now called constraint. What was vigilance is now called fear. Their frugality, not the desire to possess, is avarice. Formerly, the goods of individuals made up the public treasury. The public treasury has now become the patrimony of individuals. The republic is a cast-off husk. And its strength is no more than the power of a few citizens and the license of all. This was written in the 1600s. In modern America, the unraveling of the civil society had been subtly persistent, but is now intensifying. Evidence of rising utopian statism, the allure of political demagogues and self-appointed masterminds peddling abstractions and fantasies in pursuit of a non-existent paradisiacal society, and the concomitant accretion of governmental power in an increasingly authoritarian and centralized federal leviathan abounds. The ruling generation's governing policies are already forecast to diminish the quality of life of future generations. Among other things, witness the massive welfare and entitlement state, which is concurrently expanding and imploding, 
and the brazen abandonment of constitutional firewalls and governing limitations. If not appropriately and expeditiously ameliorated, the effects will be dire. And the ruling generation knows it. That is, we know it. But we don't give a damn. We won't be around. What about our kids? Which takes us back to the beginning of what I read to you. What about our kids? Don't we care about them? Our kids, our grandkids, maybe the next generation after that. We can't be certain. It's not science. What are we doing to them? What's going to happen to them? Now, I wrote this in 2015. I wrote this nine years ago. And I dedicated the book to my beloved family, fellow countrymen, and future generations. What do you think is going to happen 25 years ago when I'm gone and people read this book about what's happening in the country? So we come full circle here to this Bloomberg report. And no matter how they ran their computer model, and they ran it over and over and over and over again, indeed they ran it a million simulations. It found that what we are doing to ourselves is unsustainable. And so the, the mantra that they're going to shut down the government will look awfully quaint and stupid when the entire economy collapses because we didn't shut down the government. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Our once mighty dollars under siege from runaway inflation. For those still working, your paychecks buy less while costs for gas, food, cars, utilities skyrocket thanks to inflation. That's why I'm urging all my listeners to register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. It's a fantastic seminar. They'll teach you how to take steps to help guard your wealth from inflation using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and silver hold intrinsic value that should remain untouched by government manipulation. Folks, don't wait for the Fed's reckless policies to completely devalue the dollar and steal your life savings. Call now while free registration is open. I'm telling you, this is a fantastic seminar. Call 800 900 8000 right now. The Gold and Silver Summit could provide the vital insights we need to protect our families. 800 900 8000. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Always consult your financial and tax professional. I've told you now for months and months and months, maybe years even, about the likes of Jake Tapper. You see, as we've discussed here many times, as Norman Podhorst wrote in a very brilliant book, as my wife has told me for the longest amount of time. For Democrats, for hardcore Democrats, the party is their religion. Even for, as an example, ethnic Jews or ethnic anybody. It's the Democrat Party. It's that philosophy that's been ingrained in them. Their parents were Democrats, their grandparents. It's reinforced in elementary school, middle school, high school, colleges and universities for sure, and through the media. And this is Jake Tapper's defect. And he's not the only one to have this kind of a mental defect. And why am I focused on him when we come back? Because this segment's over. I'll explain why. I'll be right back. Attention, fellow Americans, Mark Levin here with a warning and a solution. I feel like our country's being destroyed by out-of-control spending and debt thanks to Biden and the American Marxists. And your hard-earned savings and retirement could be at risk from their socialist schemes. That's why you should consider Advantage Gold the best of the best, a U.S.-based company that specializes in helping everyday Americans protect their wealth. They have a simple solution to help you even potentially grow your wealth despite the attacks from Washington. I urge you to register for their upcoming Gold and Silver Summit. It's fabulous. A free online event where you'll learn tips to help safeguard your finances by diversifying into physical precious metals. 
Call 800-900-8000. Call them right now to sign up securely for this pivotal summit. It is crucial. Tell them Mark Levin sent you for a special bonus. Call 800-900-8000 right now. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. This is America's Constitutional Convention. The Mark Levin Show. Call in now. 877-381-3811. I want to remind you, there's supposed to be a distinction between a journalist, so-called news reporter, and people who just give their opinions. But as we know, that's sort of a quaint memory of times past, because that doesn't exist anymore. Jake Tapper is out of the closet in many ways. He's out of the closet as a Biden pom-pom boy. He's out of the closet as a supporter of Hamas, and he has been for a long time. Now, it doesn't mean he likes what they did on October 7th, but his propaganda is consistent, as is Dana Bash. Another individual who believes the Democrat Party and its ideology is her God. And there are many who do of various faiths and beliefs. But here's Jake Tapper on CNN today, hat tip, newsbusters, urging the Wisconsin Democrat Party chairman, Ben Wickler, to make sure the pro-Hamas voters in the state turn out for Biden in November. Cut 19, go. Let me posit another theory. Maybe those 46,000 people, because they are super engaged, they would turn out and vote, uh, basically a protest vote, even though uh, President Biden is going to be the nominee. They didn't need to do that, but they're motivated and they're engaged, as you say. Let's say they go and they vote for Jill Stein or Cornell West or Robert Kennedy Jr. I take your point. They're not going to vote for Trump. But I, if I were you and I'm sure you're a very smart guy and well-respected. I'm sure privately you agree with me, at least. These 46,000 are not necessarily going to vote for for Joe Biden. No, no, no. Stop a second. Now, notice the passion. Hey, hey, man, these 46,000, they may go third party. They're not going to necessarily vote for Biden. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? Who are these 46,000? Well, some of them are fantastic people, and some of them are the river to the sea crowd. How do we know that? Because they tell us that. They chant it. Their imams chant it. I guess we're supposed to play Helen Keller. I don't play Helen Keller. I prefer Thomas Paine and Paul Revere. Go ahead. Oh, no one's saying anyone's necessarily voting for anyone. I don't think uh, any candidate should take any voter for granted. So there's absolutely work to do to show voters that their voices are being heard. And most importantly, address the wrenching humanitarian crisis that's playing out before our eyes on on CNN and everywhere else. See, 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 ladies and gentlemen. The Democrats believe that their only hope is if Israel loses. Because the river to the sea crowd want to extinguish the state of Israel and the people who live there. And the Democrat Party will sell its proverbial soul for 10,000 votes. And they're telling you that. And they're being urged to do that by the likes of fake Jake Tap Out Tapper. And when they have a representative of the Israeli government, Benjamin Netanyahu himself, or even somebody who's not necessarily in the Likud party who's on CNN, they trash them, they interrupt them, they berate them. Because they're all in the end, pro-Joe Biden, pro-Democrat party, anti-American and anti-Israel. That's what they are. It's a big country, America. We have over 330 million people. Many of us are actually here as legal citizens. And CNN reaches almost nobody when you consider it. In fact, cable as a rule reaches almost nobody as a percentage of the population. Almost nobody's watching network news anymore. Almost nobody's watching Sunday shows anymore. The biggest audiences are right here. Talk radio and podcasting. That's the biggest audience. 
The problem is repetition. Some people hear it. They repeat it. They repeat it. It's like whisper down the lane. That's the problem. But the media are really horrific. I'll give you another example. You have this louse, this rogue, this thug, Jack Smith. Jack Smith has violated rules of professional conduct. He leaks like a sieve. He used a grand jury in Washington, D.C. that should have been a grand jury in Florida for the initial charges against President Trump in the so-called document case. He succeeded in getting a federal judge. He was handling two cases, obviously, to destroy Donald Trump's due process rights. He runs to the appellate court, and then he runs to the U.S. Supreme Court demanding that he hold a rushed trial and get to the conviction as fast as possible because he knows what kind of jury he'll have in Washington. That is an anti-Trump jury, not a jury of Trump's peers. Figures he's got the whole thing set up. He's dusted off old laws that actually have nothing to do with January 6th. Never charged Trump with insurrection, despite the media regurgitating insurrection over and over again. Like it's the only word they know, except when it applies to Biden and the Democrats. Well, he's got a real judge now in Florida. Not Chunkin. Not these Democrat hack judges in New York. I'll get to Marshawn later. No, no, no. He's got a real judge in Florida. And you know... Judge Aileen Cannon's a real judge when the media keeps saying she's appointed by Trump. Over and over again, appointed by Trump. Now let's let's understand that every judge is appointed by somebody. So they're upset, you see, that it's not a Biden or Obama or Clinton judge. It's a Trump judge. Now a Biden, Obama, or Clinton judge we can trust. Like Judge Chunkin. Or the two knuckleheads on the three-judge panel at the D.C. Circuit Court. Oh, yes, you didn't keep hearing they were Biden appointees, two of them, did you? You didn't keep hearing Chunkin is an Obama appointee, did you? No, you didn't. You didn't hear that the motions judge who denied Donald Trump his attorney-client privilege was an Obama-appointed judge, did you? No. But this judge, her middle name is... Trump appointed. So there you go with the media right away. So here's the news from our friends at the Washington Examiner, Kayleen Deese. Special counsel Jack Smith tore into the judge presiding over former President Donald Trump's classified documents case, claiming her proposed jury instructions contained a, quote, flawed legal premise, unquote, worthy of appeal, according to a late filing today. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon. Now, you see, Smith is writing his briefs also for the legal analysts at CNN and MSLSD and the New York Slimes and the Washington Compost. The judge had ordered defense lawyers for Trump and prosecutors to file submissions outlining hypothetical jury instructions based on competing interpretations of two laws relevant to the case. Her March 18 order suggested Trump may have had a legal right under the Presidential Records Act to declare records as personal after leaving office, a premise Smith said was wrong. And we all know that that Jack Smith is prosecutor, judge, and jury. How dare she suggest otherwise. Cannon, even the Washington Examiner, a Trump appointee, asked both parties to write two versions of proposed jury instructions that frame the matters jurors must review before considering a person's guilt or innocence. So Smith is furious that Cannon is asking for instructions, their opinions, that might involve saying to the jury, You have to decide whether the Presidential Records Act allows a president to retain records as personal or whether they're official records. And what Smith is saying, no, 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 no. I get to decide that. Says the answer is no. They're not personal records. This is not a matter for a jury. 
This is what he and the other legal analysts are saying. Not a matter for a jury. I, Smith, the government, I, the unconstitutionally appointed hack, rogue prosecutor, who's done everything possible to cut corners, to undermine the Constitution, I get to decide if the Presidential Records Act apply. apply. It does not. Therefore, that is not something that should be raised in instructions to the jury. The first scenario, I asked them to consider whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that any records Trump was found to have kept at home were personal or presidential. This is why he's flipping out. Wait a minute. This is a slam dunk case. He took government property he had no right to. Guilty. She said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not exactly what the Presidential Records Act says. The second told parties to respond to a premise that juries and courts lack the expertise to review or determine whether a president has sole authority under the Presidential Records Act to categorize records as personal. See, here's the problem. Jack Smith is bringing what we call cases of first impression, as I've explained to you before. Because nobody's ever brought cases like this before. Well, nobody's ever done what Trump has done. That's a lie. Biden did it, Bill Clinton did it, Hillary Clinton did it, none of them were charged. And in one case involving Bill Clinton, when Judicial Watch brought its case in front of a Obama judge in the District of Columbia, the judge all but said that the Presidential Records Act protects Bill Clinton. And notice nowhere in any single news story do they mention that, that there's precedent for this from an Obama judge. Did I say Obama? Obama judge. Judge Jackson. Oh, yes, there were two Jacksons on that court, both of which are miserable. But let's continue. Determine whether a president has sole authority under the Presidential Records Act to categorize records as personal. So I was saying, these are cases of first impression. They have constitutional ramifications. So when Jack Smith says, or the legal analysts, predictably on MSLSD and the Constipated News Network, they go on about these instructions are intended to destroy the prosecution's case. No, the prosecution's case has to withstand scrutiny. Right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. Who says the Presidential Records Act means that a president who believes that this is his property is wrong? Where's that written? Where's the precedent for that? There is no precedent for that. Trump's attorneys leaned into their argument that the former president had control over the designation of documents that he's accused of illegally retaining. Quote, you heard evidence during the trial that President Trump exercised that authority at times verbally and at times without using formal procedures. While he was president, Trump's legal team wrote in its proposed jury instructions, I instruct you that those declassification decisions are examples of valid and legally appropriate uses of President Trump's declassification authority while he was president of the United States. This is an argument I made months, 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 months ago. First one to do it. Again, it's a case of first impression in the right. There's no requirement under the Constitution. The president is the executive branch. Everything flows from him. He doesn't need the permission of underlings. He doesn't need the permission of the CIA, the FBI, or anybody else. He doesn't need to put it in writing. He doesn't need to say to his staff, I am making a declaration that everything I'm taking with me is declassified. I am making a declaration that everything I'm taking with me is personal. When he does it, the actions say the words. But let me go on. And by the way, if that wants to be changed... You're going to have to amend the Constitution of the United States as it applies to the executive branch. Isn't it amazing, by the way? The Democrats demand Elizabeth Warren at the front of the line, so that tells you what a bunch of kooks they are. The Democrats demand that Biden rule by executive order. Go ahead and Google it. It's all over the... Rule by executive order, and damn it if you lose the election. Push out executive orders like they're coming out of all your orifices. Push them out fast. So, in other words, the executive branch legislates. No matter what the people say, no matter the mandate, you don't like Biden, you defeat Biden, they're saying, do it, do it, do it, now. But when it comes to an actual constitutional power the president has, whether or not to declassify 
and a determination on whether documents are documents of the government are his, there they say, well, that's way out of the box. You can't do that. You can't do that. So Biden is issuing a trillion dollars in student loan forgiveness in defiance of the Supreme Court. Not a word. Biden is violating scores of sections of immigration law, violating the Constitution's take care clause. Not a word. You can't impeach him for that. That's just a policy decision. Trump and his lawyers argue he took these documents. He had a right to possess them. By the act of taking them, he declassified them. Oh, my God, that's so over the top. So the judge is saying, well, this is a determination we have to make. And I'll add, we're not going to listen to the buffoons on CNN and MSNBC, the clown shows, the conga line of, of morons to make our decisions here. This is a legitimate question that needs to be addressed. I'm going to continue this when I return. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. My fellow Americans, we're living in very perilous economic times. Washington seems determined to bankrupt our nation with endless stimulus spending. As they devalue our dollar, hardworking Americans like you could lose everything. That's why I urge you strongly, register for the upcoming Gold and Silver Summit hosted by our friends at Advantage Gold. They'll teach you how to help guard your wealth using asset diversification into physical precious metals. Gold and silver can offer a defense against the dollar's devaluation, and the experts at Advantage Gold will explain how you can convert some of your savings into precious metals that can protect and potentially grow your wealth. With currency debasement from Washington and global uncertainty on the rise, gold and silver diversification could offer you some stability. Call 800-900-8000 right now to sign up. 800-900-8000 now. Tell them Mark Levin sent you. Performance may vary. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. You should always consult your financial and tax professional. Trump is charged with 32 counts of violating the Espionage Act, with each count corresponding to a classified document he's alleged to have retained. So he overcharges the guy, even if you were going to charge three, four counts. No, 32. That's, this guy's a diabolical SOB. To have retained these documents illegally after leaving the Oval Office, he also faces eight counts related to alleged obstruction of officials' efforts to retrieve the materials. That was a complete setup. There never should have been the criminalization of this case, ever. Ever. And of course this guy's angry with the judge who's trying to put justice on the table and not and not be a, a, effectively a judge for the government like Chunkin is, or these, these Democrat elected judges in, in New York. She's actually a referee. And again, a case of first impression that raises constitutional issues, and the prosecutor, no, damn it, you can't give those instructions, and I'm going to appeal, and the media's there. Wow, he taught her. What a bunch of dumb bastards. Just remember, this is the Hamas media who hate your guts. We'll be right back. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877 381 877-381-3811. I feel great today. I've been feeling great for many days, actually. See, one of the ways that I deal with all the depressing things that are going on is come on this program and pound away at evil, pound away at tyranny, and pound away 
at those, and I name them like few others do, responsible for hell on earth. And I think for many of you, you experience it through me, because obviously we can't all have a microphone. But I want to finish this thing with Jack Smith, Jack the Ripper Smith, a legal illiterate who had his ass kicked by the Supreme Court once before. As to this judge with these scenarios in terms of jury instructions and the input of the, of the prosecution and the defense... Here's what Smith writes in Parth. Both scenarios rest on an unstated and fundamentally flawed legal premise, namely that the Presidential Records Act, and in particular its distinction between personal and presidential records, determines whether a former president is authorized under the Espionage Act to possess highly classified documents and store them in an unsecure facility, the special counsel's team wrote, arguing a jury that is presented with such instructions would distort the trial. I've decided, says Smith, that a former president is not authorized to take these documents. I've decided this. You, judge, get the hell out of my way. You know, it's interesting. This Presidential Records Act and the Espionage Act never did work well together. They never really made a lot of sense together. You know, one was written in uh, 1917. The other one in 1978, in effect, of the beginning of the Reagan administration. And, of course, the boneheads in Congress didn't exactly look at one or the other. But in some ways, they conflict. They just do. And then on top of that, you have the constitutional issue of what can a president take with him? What can a president take with him? Now, before the Presidential Records Act, there was no issue. A president could take whatever they want. That's why you have official documents, quote-unquote, that you can purchase that are signed by George Washington or Jefferson, that are signed by James Madison or Abraham Lincoln or Franklin Roosevelt or Richard Nixon, for that matter. Some of you may possess these documents. Well, after 1978... Uh, the law is basically that those documents cannot be treated that way. But what if a president treats them that way? Well, we don't really know, do we? See, a statute cannot trump the Constitution. So the question is if they're personal records or not. And then the second question is whether they're classified or not. Now, even if you hold that they're not personal records, there's no criminal provision in the Presidential Records Act. It's basically the codifying of an administrative act. So there is no criminal aspect to the Presidential Records Act. Then you have the Espionage Act, which, of course, there are criminal aspects to, but under Comey's interpretation, there needs to be specific intent, so he gives Hillary a pass. Under special counsel Hur's interpretation, if you're an imbecile, the law doesn't apply to you, so we can't convict you. Of course, he was wrong. So it didn't apply to Biden, even though Biden stole documents as a senator, stole documents as a private citizen, stole documents as a vice president, and worse, as I keep saying, he used classified information related to Afghanistan to get a book deal. So in other words, essentially, he sold the classified information in order to get an $8 million payday from his publisher. Not the publisher's fault. How would they know? No, it's Biden's fault. They don't know that I have these. That is the most important sentence in the entire report, and it's the most damnable sentence in the entire report. And, of course, there's other issues this judge is going to have to decide, and Smith doesn't want to decide on them, among them. What about the equal application of the laws? What about it? What about this constitutional issue that a president can declassify just by his own actions? And what about this immunity case that's up at the Supreme Court? Everybody says it'll be 9-0. 
It would be 8-1 to one if I were on the Supreme Court, that's for sure. And all these issues of first impression, all these constitutional complex issues only exist because Jack Smith brought them. He didn't care. As I've pointed out, Jack Smith, if he'd been a Republican, he would have indicted Biden if he'd been the special counsel, and he wouldn't have given a damn what a half a century of tradition is in Republican and Democrat attorneys general's offices, which is you can't indict a sitting president, or at least you shouldn't. Jack Smith wouldn't care. And so he's out there indicting a former president on January 6th, because we all know January 6th was actually 1871, and that Donald Trump is actually a member of the Klan, and the Espionage Act, which was passed at the urging of Woodrow Wilson to use against his political opponents to imprison them and silence them if they opposed his actions in World War I. And now Biden is using it to try and imprison Donald Trump. Now, none of these cases should have been brought because the position, the official position of the Justice Department in the past is, number one, don't interfere with an election. Number two, don't stretch case law or statutes to the point where you're just finding a reason to indict somebody, let alone a former president who's running for president again. It was amazing to me when I heard this idiot Judge Pond on the, a Biden appointee, whose husband is another sleazeball, who's on the circuit court in D.C., and she's talking about, well, what if he murders somebody and does this? You know, I think that's a pretty clear-cut case. But she didn't want to argue the actual case in front of her. Because she said it wouldn't give her what she wants. And so we get these idiotic arguments rather than the case that's in front of us. And now we move down to or up to New York, if you're in Washington or Florida, to Judge Merchan. Judge Merchan is a complete hack who has butchered the Constitution and the law. And he is the kind of judge who is doing Alvin Bragg's bidding as opposed to Eileen Cannon. So they hate Cannon and they love Mershon. I don't know how much more repulsively conflicted a judge can be than when his daughter is raising funds as the president of a Democrat fundraising and consulting operation for Adam Smith and Chuck Schumer's PAC, in part by using Judge Daddy's case that he's overseeing to raise funds. That's more than an appearance of a conflict of interest. That is an actual conflict of interest. Because depending on how the judge rules, for instance, if he had ruled out of the box, this case is a dead letter. I'm dismissing it on the papers. It's, mer- it's meritless. That's why the Federal Election Commission said no. The U.S. Attorney's Office said no under Biden. And Cy Vance, the former left-wing Manhattan DA said no. Alvin Bragg originally said no. Then Alvin Bragg says yes. After a Biden hack, who was the acting number three at the Department of Justice, joins his staff and takes control of the case. And now the judge, of course, has ruled that Donald Trump's not allowed to talk about this. He can't criticize this and the, because of potential death threat. Excuse me. That's not the test of the First Amendment under the federal Constitution. Potential possible. You've got to have some material attachment, some, something actual, tangible. He has nothing. And by the way, Donald Trump didn't threaten anybody. When this clown Reggie Walton, the so-called judge, goes on CNN and says, look, you can't, you can't make threats. He made no threats. The only person to make a threat was Chuck Schumer. And he's still sliding on his belly across the planet Earth. What I'm trying to convey to you, most of you non-lawyers, and it's okay, it's important. When I go through these cases, when I go through these scenarios, when I explain who these people are, when I explain what these statutes are, how they're cutting corners, how they're creating cases of first impression, your general conclusion should be, this is as sleazy as it gets, that the legal system is no longer a justice system. 
as Frederick Bastiat would say, that the legal system is being used to destroy justice and due process and equal protection. It doesn't deserve our respect. These judges who are defying the law, who are defying constitutional processes, they don't deserve our respect because they don't respect the law and the Constitution that they're supposed to uphold. Why should we respect them and their decisions if they don't respect the documents that they choose not to enforce? The question I raised in Men in Black, as a matter of fact. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. L-E-V-I-N. Our buddy Greg Jarrett has a great piece up that I am uh, posting. The judge in Donald Trump's upcoming Manhattan trial harbors a contempt for the rule of law that is sadly typical these days of liberal jurists. Inflamed by Trump's public salvos about the unfairness of the case against him, Judge Juan Marchand imposed a gag order preventing the former president from criticizing court staff and members of their families, including his honor's adult daughter. Let's begin with the basics. Gag orders are almost always a prior restraint on speech and presumptively unconstitutional. Silencing a defendant violates his or her First Amendment rights. Such orders are often a judicial abuse of law, but some judges do it anyway because they're imperious, arrogant, and can get away with it. And by the time a gagged defendant appeals, it is invariably too late because the trial is over. As the leading candidate for president, Trump has an elevated right to exercise his freedom of expression, especially where his opponents have weaponized the law by bringing politically motivated charges against him to unduly influence the upcoming elections. Anyone accused of a crime is a constitutionally protected right, we've talked about this, to defend himself in a court of law as well as the court of public opinion. And that includes justified criticism of the trial judge who has a noted history of liberal bias. Mershon donated to Trump's opponent, Joe Biden, and also gave money to an anti-Trump cause, although the amount was small. Doesn't matter. But the judge's daughter is also fair game for criticism. Lauren Marchand is a public figure who runs a prominent progressive political consulting firm that handles outspoken Trump opponents like Adam Schiff, who was infamously censured by his own colleagues in Congress for peddling endless lies about Trump and the notorious Russia hoax. Significantly, Marchand's daughter has a financial or economic interest in her father's case. Again, we've talked about this. She said... Her clients raised some $93 million in campaign donations by citing the Trump prosecution in their solicitation mailings, according to reporting by the New York Post. And that should be the end of this judge. But he's an arrogant puke. He's a punk. On this basis alone, Judge Merchant was obligated to recuse himself because a member of his family, which has identified a child under strict ethical guidance, has a private vested interest in the outcome of the case, yet he refuses to step aside despite the glaring conflict of interest, meaning the fix is in. There's no exemption under the First Amendment protecting family members of judges. Rashant's gag order is as wrongful as his decision not to disqualify himself in favor of a different judge who has no such conflict, 
might actually be objective and neutral, you know, like a judge like Cannon in Florida. The appearance of impropriety by itself is sufficient for recusal under Section 100.2 of the Code of Judicial Conduct in New York. In his gag order, Merchant would have us believe that Trump's comments may induce violent threats. Yet, there's no evidence of that. None. If it were otherwise, the former president would be charged with obstruction or tampering. But he hasn't been, because he confined his remarks to complaints about inability to obtain a fair trial in New York from a compromised judge and a Democrat district attorney, Alvin Bragg, who brought an anemic and time-barred prosecution by contorting the law. It's perfectly okay for witnesses such as Stormy Daniels and confessed liar Michael Cohen to trash Trump in their endless interviews and public comments, but the victim of their attacks has gagged. The double standard should be obvious to everyone. This unequal application of the law was compounded when a federal judge, Reggie Walton, recently appeared on CNN for the sole purpose of condemning Trump. But the target of Walton's ire's citizen Trump has his free speech rights curtailed. He's saying the judge attacks him and he can't even speak to that. The right to a fair trial embodied in the 6th and 14th Amendments protects the accused, not the accuser or the judge. They have no, no such right, but they do have sacred obligations to see that justice is done fairly, equitably, and impartially. Both Judge Juan Mershon and D.A. Alvin Bragg have forsaken their duties by making a mockery of ethical standards. They have failed to uphold the integrity of our legal system and the honor of judicial independence. Is it any wonder many Americans have lost confidence in courts of law? Very well written. And again, that's something we've talked about because, look, if you're a serious lawyer who's actually practiced, whether you're a Trump supporter or not, you know that this is as sleazy as hell. And this is not the kind of courtrooms that we ought to have in America. With this guy Erdogan and Amr Shan, you can't have people who are political hacks hand them black robes because they happen to get elected on the ballot because they're political hacks, and then give them respect that they don't deserve when they don't respect you. Mr. Mershon should have recused himself a long time ago. And now the president's lawyers said they want to go to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court on a, on a couple of issues, and so the, the trial should be stayed. And this judge ruled, no, no, you're too late. You should have brought that earlier. What is he talking about? This whole case was brought late, the purpose of which to, was to interfere in the election. This whole case is a concoction, just like the case involving Trump's money and his property, a complete concoction. The worst of it are the people on TV who are complete sleazeballs. The people on TV, the Weissmans, the phony former federal prosecutors, that ought to frighten the hell out of you. These phony former federal prosecutors on TV cheering this on, celebrating it. And these local political hacks dressed up as judges in these, in these Potemkin courtrooms, they watch this on TV and they love the adulation that these clowns give them. I'll be right back. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. N-L-E-V-I-N. You're listening to Denali. 
The Great One. The Great One. And you can call in now. 877-381-3811. One more, Judge. I can't go through all 1,200 of them on the federal bench, but let's deal with this one. From The Blaze. What a great... What a great platform, The Blaze, if I say so myself. This is by David Urbanski. Federal judge rips the FDNY, the, F- the Fire Department of New York, and when considering what all those guys have been through, and that department's been through, for heckling Letitia James with booze and Trump chants. But it's worse. He says it is about race. You see, they're racist. That's right, the Fire Department of New York, the first responders on 9-11, the great men and women of the Fire Department in our biggest city, they're all racists because they booed Letitia James. This is from a federal judge. In the wake of New York City Fire Department members heckling State Attorney General Letitia James, I'm surprised he didn't put a gag order on all these citizens because, you know, he, if he could, he would. Last month with booze and Trump chants, U.S. District Court Judge Nicholas G-A-R-A-U-F-I-S, Grayufus, Garufus, Garufas, whatever, said the incident wasn't about politics but about race, the New York Daily News reported. Now, why would he say that? I've lived in New York City all my life. I know what the problem is. And believe me, front and center is what happened the other day, the judge said in reference to the heckling incidents. The paper noted, this doesn't have to do with politics. This has to do with race. What is it with these? It's like this guy, Reggie Walton. Hey, hey, I'm coming on CNN. I'm going to tell you what about this guy, Trump, and the threats. He didn't make any threats. Well, you know. What's the background? Well, Letitia James was booed as she walked to the podium to speak at a March 8 FDNY promotion ceremony at the Christian Cultural Center's Brooklyn campus. James told the not-too-happy-to-see-her-firefighters, oh, come on, we're in a house of God. Now, I would ask the judge this. Is this how you view people who walk into your courtroom? That they are, based on your experience, based on what you've witnessed in the city, that they're racist if they don't share your views? Is that right? Tell me, ladies and gentlemen, if Tim, Squ- if Tim Scott had walked into that room, do you think he would have been booed? Of course not. If Ben Carson had walked in that room, you think he would have been booed? Of course not. Letitia James is booed because she's a Marxist bastard. That's why. It's nothing to do with race. How often do I lay into Bernie Sanders? Last time I checked, he's white as white can be. Anyway. When they didn't stop, James motioned with her hands and said, simmer down. But soon the firefighters began chanting, Trump, Trump, Trump. Well, that must be racist because we know he's Hitler. I think he used the word, what did he say? What word did he use, Mr. Producer? What's that word he's not allowed to use again? Yes. New York Post reported that FDNY Chief of Department John Hopkins, in response, fired off an email to other agency honchos warning a reckoning led by the Department's Bureau of Investigation and Trials was coming over the course of booze and chants of Trump that James received at Thursday's event. Oh, so now they're under investigation, the firefighters. Now they're under investigation. BITS whatever that is, is investigating this so they will figure out who the members are, Hodges wrote in an email to FDNY leadership, according to the Post, adding that, I recommend they come forward. Just confess. Get on your knees and beg. I've been told by the commissioner it will be better for them if they come forward and we don't have to hunt them down. You believe this, French? The heckling presumably had to do with James targeting former President Trump in a civil fraud case. They resulted in over $450 million. Well, you know what it resulted in. It's worth noting that James's political campaign for Attorney General focused on her insistence that she would go after Trump. Now, this judge, Gary Rufas, he said this has to do with race. 
A declaration directed toward the FDNY was part of his reaction to a complaint from the Vulcan Society of Black Firefighters. The Vulcan Society, what the hell is that? Which is in the midst of a civil rights settlement with the department that the judge is overseeing the Daily News. This is so sleazy, the whole damn thing. It's just unbelievable. Who the hell would want to live in New York anymore? I'm being honest. Your courts are corrupt. The judges are outrageous. You got these groups all about racism and bigotry and groupthink and all the rest. I mean, who, who wants to deal with this? What's the, nobody wants to deal with this. Vulcan Society President Regina Wilson told the judge at a March 14th status conference that the FDNY members heckling James demonstrates a racist culture. At the department, the Daily News added, oh, right, it's a racist culture to criticize an elected attorney general who targets a former president in the middle of an election, uses a statute that's never been used before in the circumstances, says she's going to take him out, target him. That's what she's trying to do. And so if you boo her, oh, you must be a racist. She said, I, I don't know if you had an opportunity to just see the vile nature of these members, even when we were at a Christian cultural center. That's right. Better to do it in a courtroom. Right? The head of the Vulcans. What's her name again? I thought Vulcans was like Star Trek, Mr. Medusa. Isn't that what it is? I mean, I haven't watched it lately. The Vulcans? Didn't they have a planet or something? The Vulcan Society president, Regina Wilson, I could be missing something in the culture. It wouldn't be the first time. I live in a cocoon, and I do it by choice. So in other words, it would have been okay if it wasn't in a church, right? No, 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 it wouldn't have been okay because they're racist bastards. Now, in response to her, Judge Garifas demanded that the FDNY commissioner, Laura Kavanaugh, and the New York City's corporate counsel, Sylvia Hines Radix, appear before him at the next status conference in the case in May to explain why it's taking so long for the department to answer equal opportunity complaints. Get on it! Get on it! Chase these guys down! Hunt them down! Punish them! Destroy their careers! How dare they boo Letitia James! Unbelievable. It's a federal judge. Gara Ufus. Gara Ufus. Let's see something here, Mr. Producer. Bear with me, America. This is live and national. And as a semi professional, I have to do as I have to do here. Judge Gara Ufus. Who appointed him, I wonder? Hold on, folks. Stick with me. Uh, let's see. Sir, does he get. Bill Clinton appointed him. Well, why doesn't that say it in the story? Prior to his appointment, Judge Gareth Fufus, or Doofus, served for more than five years as the chief counsel of the Federal Aviation Administration in Washington, overseeing a staff of 200 attorneys. And prior to the appointment to the Clinton administration, he served for nine years as counsel to the Queens Borough President, Claire Shulman, in New York City. In other words, he's a political hack. Began his career in 1974 as an associate of Chadbourne and Park. He also served as Assistant Attorney General of the Litigation Bureau of the New York State Attorney General's Office. Oh, okay. Under Attorney General Louis Lefkowitz. He practiced law privately in Queens. He has a very thin background. Going to the federal bench from the bureaucracy at the Federal Aviation Administration. But he's obviously a Democrat Party hack, aren't you, Judge? And what you're doing to the greatest fire department on the face of the earth that more than proved themselves on 9-11 makes me sick to my stomach. You deserve no respect. And now he's calling the fire department of New York, which we honor on every September 11th, which we remember, whose members ran into those towers where hundreds of them died as heroes. 
racists. Racists. Because they dared to boo Letitia James. That's the kind of putrid, low-level lawyers, slip-and-fall, hack, party lawyers who serve as judges today. Judge Gara Doofus. You're the racist. You are. That statement you made was outrageous. You don't even know these individuals. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they believe. As far as you know, there's intermarriage. As far as you know, people in that audience weren't all white. And yet you make the statement you make, Judge. You're a disgusting disgrace. A disgusting disgrace. Now you're trashing the FDNY. Broad brush. They must be racist. And I know. I've lived here. I've experienced it. I go to hell. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Nowadays, 20 bucks barely gets you a burger and fries and maybe a quarter tank of gasoline. You know what it will get you, though? For just $20 a month, you can get unlimited talk, text, and plenty of 5G data from my cell phone company, Pure Talk. You'll get the same quality of service as AT&T, Verizon, or T-Mobile, but for half the cost. The average family saves almost $1,000 a year, all with no contracts and no activation fees. You can trade your phone or get great deals on the latest iPhones and Androids. Make the switch today and save an additional 50% off your first month. Choose a wireless company that shares our values, that supports our military and veterans, that creates American jobs, and refuses to advertise on fake news networks. Instead, they're right here with us. Just go to puretalk.com slash Levin, puretalk.com slash L-E-V-I-N, and make the switch right now so you can actually afford that burger and fries. That's puretalk.com slash Levin. Levin, L-E-V-I-N. My experience, Judge Garadufus, is that your entire bench is racist. That's my experience. What are you going to do, gag me? That whole legal community in New York City, grotesque. Filled with slip and fall ambulance chasing lawyers who work their way up the judgeships. They work through the political Democrat Party system, whether it's Clinton, whoever it is. They get a black robe on, and boy, they are ready to hammer away. Not do justice, do injustice. See, these judges think they can say anything, and they pretty much can. The bar's not going to touch them. They're the same party. They're all buddies. They go out drinking together. They socialize together. You know, just like in Washington, New York, all these people. And this judge, he can get away with saying whatever the hell he wants, just like Reggie Walton gets away with saying whatever the hell he wants. And our buddy, Attorney Davis, Mike Davis, has filed an ethics complaint against Walton. And I'm glad he did. Landmark Legal Foundation was about to file a complaint. Our buddy Pete Hutchison, who was the president, But Davis went ahead and did it, and that's great. And his complaint covered everything that we were going to cover. So it's good. He filed against Walton. But then again, who are you filing with? A bunch of Democrats. You know, they're not going to give them the John Eastman treatment. Here's a guy that was disbarred in California for doing nothing, for giving his legal opinion, whether people like it or not. That's what lawyers are supposed to do. Disbarred. Disbarred. No, he was leading an insurrection. No, he wasn't. He didn't lead an insurrection. Joe Biden's leading an insurrection. Joe Biden's defying the Supreme Court. Joe Biden's violating immigration laws. Joe Biden is responsible for deaths and mayhem on the southern border. He's the one leading an insurrection. Not John Eastman, for God's sakes. Country's in grave, grave danger. Grave, grave danger. And I want you to know, If I ever leave this microphone, it won't be by choice. It won't be by choice, Mr. Producer. It'll be because they got me. But they can never shut me up. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. 
Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, Now, I want to choose some of the most stupid people making some of the most stupid comments in the next few minutes. Stephen Hassan, who is he? Nobody knows. Plucked out of obscurity by the clowns at MSLSD. Some booker found him, saw that he was a radical kook. One of them, the conga line of radical kooks over at MSLSD. He's a psychotherapist. Now you figure if he's working at MSNBC, he's obviously doing an evaluation on their hosts because they're all psycho. But no, he's doing an evaluation on you. Have you ever met him? No. But just like Judge Putz, whatever his name is in New York, attacking the FDNY as racist, sickening. Now we have Stephen Hassan, a psycho psychotherapist, I would say, on MSLSD, psychoanalyzing you. Ready for this one? And by the way, this isn't the first time. You remember four or five years ago, they brought the woman on and I had her on my program. It was going on about Trump and his issues, his psychological issues, and she wrote a book, and she was violating all the ethics rules. Whatever happened to her? I think she got the hook. But it's, you know, they replace each other. So now we have Stephen Hassan, psycho-psychotherapist on MSLSD, and rather than taking the temperature of all the morons there, he's taking your temperature. You've never heard of him. You've never seen him. He's never talked to you. He's never seen you. But he knows you. Cut four, go. The critical thing is explaining the influence continuum Ooh. from from ethical to unethical influence. Yes, 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 and yes. that ethical influence is informed yes. consent, yes, re- respecting yes. conscience. Yes. And mind control, authoritarian cultism yes. creates this yes. uh, dissociative disorder where people yes, are dependent does. and obedient. They become clones mm. yes. of the cult member. The critical yes. thing with MAGA people MAGA. is I recommend people talk about Chinese communist what? Brainwashing and these methods yes, and pimps yes. and traffickers what? because they all use behavior control, information oh control, thought control, yes. and emotional control oh to create goodness. this new pseudo identity. Wow. And by talking about a group they agree is a brainwashing group, yes, yes. we can back backtrack yeah. and ask people to think back before they started believing in what Trump. Did- wow. Did he get a degree to do this? Does he get paid to do this? Mr. Producer, would you please find this gentleman and see if he'd come on our program? I need to be deprogrammed. Stephen Hassan, psychotherapist on MSNBC. Seriously. Mr. Hassan, I'd love to speak to you because I think we all have such such problems, you know. We maggot people, make America great again. Notice they never say what it means, make America great again, because they don't believe in it. They don't believe in it. They are FTA people. You know what FTA is, Mr. Producer? Fundamentally transform America people. FTA. And so we need to familiarize ourselves with Chinese communist brainwashing, pimps and traffickers. Behavioral control. Now, the funny thing is, that's what I accuse them of. In a full chapter, the Democrat Party hates America. It's very important that we speak to Stephen Hassan. But look how he does an analysis of you folks. It used to be unethical for a so-called professional to make broad-based statements about other human beings people they never met before. Now, I want you to understand something. This was done to Trump supporters before, as I told you, in 2016 and 2020. This was done to Barry Goldwater. 
Barry Goldwater when he was running for president. They did a psychoanalysis of him. And I've discussed it at length here. I even went out and bought an old copy of the magazine that doesn't exist anymore that was sued out of business. They did a, not a full page, page after page after page of psychoanalysis of Barry Goldwater. And after that horrendous attack on the Republican nominee, the profession itself put out rules of conduct and ethics that would punish psycho-psychotherapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, whatever, who would conduct themselves this way. But this guy, where is he? He's on MSLSD. I'm surprised Judge Walton hasn't gone to MSLSD. I mean, he is making the rounds, isn't he? So we will try and get this guy, and we'll see how successful we are, how confident Stephen Hassan is. Just tell him, Mr. Producer, we'd love to have him on the program to further discuss his brilliant appearance on MSNBC yesterday. Would you please? And speaking of psychos, there's Corinne Jean-Pierre. Now, Corinne Jean-Pierre really is a nobody who's accomplished nothing but her latest appointment. What does she have experience in? But she knows everything. She knows how to fight wars. She knows how Israel should be fighting wars. She knows all these things. And yet she knows nothing. And uh, she's at the White House briefing today. And I want you to listen to what she has to say. I mean, this is loathsome. She's, she's loathsome. They're all loathsome. Cut five, go. The expectation is to have a meeting in person. I think it was important that there was a virtual meeting uh, that occurred, obviously, mm-hmm, on mm-hmm, Monday mm-hmm, to talk mm-hmm. about uh, the Rafa operations. This is We've Netanyahu been very and clear. Biden. Go ahead. We've been very clear. She, she always uses the, We've been very clear. And she has to say that because they're never clear. They're mumblers. But on the one thing they're clear is they're Jew-hating and anti-Semitism for Israel. They're very clear about it now. They're completely out of the closet. Completely out of the closet. Go ahead. That's very clear. Uh, we believe there has to be uh, uh, alternative ways uh, to deal with Hamas in, in Gaza, as we're specifically in, in Rafa. Uh, a military operation, is, we believe, is not... the hell does she not- know? I don't care what you believe, lady. Who cares what you believe? Did anybody you know get slaughtered and raped and beheaded in Israel? No, they, you, you don't know anybody. You know, it amazes me. We have people in this country like her in positions of prominence who have backgrounds or whatever it is, whether it's sexual, whether it's race, whether it's ethnicity, whatever it is. And we celebrate them. They're celebrated as a society. They're celebrated because all that they've had to go through, right? She hasn't gone through anything anything compared to what those people went through on October 7th. And she stands there sanctimoniously talking about we believe there has to be an alternative way to deal with Hamas. Cares what you believe, you buffoon. And she says spewing what her imbecilic, he certified, imbecilic Biden is saying. The psycho-psychotherapist would make a visit to the White House, but no, no, he won't do that. The condescension, the know-it-all attitude, there needs to be a better way. They shouldn't go to Rafa and wipe out the leadership of Hamas. We need the leadership of Hamas. We need to protect Iran. We need to fund the PLO. We need to fund Iran. We need to make sure they can get arms to attack the Jews in Israel. Yes, yes. And then we're going to attack the Israelis when they make an accident and hit a caravan of, uh, of individuals, volunteers for providing food. I brought up Afghanistan. First one, of course. What happened then? You're going to want to watch Saturday's Life, Liberty, and Levin. Wait till you see how I deal with this. Oh, my God. I wouldn't want to be them, Mr. Producer. I wouldn't want to be them anyway, but I wouldn't want to be them after my Saturday show. This is a fact. But look look, look how they talk. Now, I'll say it for four thousandth time, in Haiti, there is no government anymore. The gangs are rampaging. The murders in the street, just walking up and murdering people and grabbing women off the street and raping them. Corinne Jean-Pierre doesn't say a word about it. 
the sex slavery of the women and the children on the southern border, which has been massively expanded under Biden because of the open borders. She didn't say a word about it. Most of those people are people of color. Not a word. I'm a white Jewish guy. I keep bringing it up. Look what's going on in the border, oh, Mark. What are, you, what are you talking about? It's the greatest level of slavery that we've had in the United States for the 15,000th time since the end of the Civil War. Where is everybody? Well, I know where you folks are, but where's the rest of them? I haven't seen a single civil rights group speak out against it. I haven't heard the Urban League, the NAACP. Most of these people are black and brown. I haven't heard LeBron James. I haven't heard, who's the idiot on MSNBC, Sharpton? None of them. Why? Why are they so quiet? Because just like self-hating Jews that put the Democrat Party ahead of everything else, you have self-hating people in every minority group who put the Democrat Party ahead of everything else too. And so all these people on the southern border, mostly from Central and South America, not exclusively, mostly brown and black, not exclusively, who are being sold into sex slavery, labor slavery, children, same thing. It's as if they don't exist. Because they got to get Biden elected. They need to protect their boy. It is horrendous. The double standards, the inhumanity, it is horrendous. You know, it's amazing. My entire career, and even before I was in broadcasting, I don't walk lockstep with the Republican Party. I never have. In many cases, I've been outside the Republican Party. There are certain things I believe that involve principles that are human principles, right and wrong, good and evil, liberty and tyranny. And regardless of politics and politicians and political parties, you have to speak out. It's not a matter of whose team you're on. You have to speak out. Where are all the voices on the slavery that's taking place on the southern border, Joy Reid? Where are you? Why aren't you condemning Joe Biden? Crickets. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. So let's let's keep track of the list of words we're not allowed to use. Vermin, bloodbath, and murder when referring to an illegal alien murder. And, of course, the media in America aren't about facts or knowledge. They're about character assassination, if you don't toe the line. Trump in Grand Rapids, Michigan yesterday. Cut 11, go. The 22-year-old nursing student in Georgia who was barbarically murdered by an illegal alien animal. Uh, The Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. Nancy Pelosi told me that. She said, please don't use the word animal, sir, when you're talking about these people. I said, I'll use the word animal because that's what they are. And he's talking about killers. Everybody knows it. But they don't want him to say what he said. They want to put words in his mouth. So here is Wolf Blitzer is a complete fraud, complete phony, hanging on to a high paying job. And Scott Jennings, who is the putative Republican, I think. But listen to this. Cut 12, go. But when he says these, uh, these immigrants are animals, they're not humans, what does that su- suggest? I mean, isn't that brutal? Shouldn't people be condemning that? I listened to the entire tape. He was specifically talking about the person who murdered Lakin Riley in Georgia. And to be honest with you, Wolf, if somebody murders another human being, I think they deserve to be called animals. And I don't think any American uh, is really going to reject that kind of rhetoric. That poor girl was murdered in cold blood. Is that person who did it not an animal? I think that's an apt term. 
So you think he was only referring to those murderers, not referring in general to illegal immigrants who are coming into the United States? I listened to the tape. That's exactly what he was talking about, in my opinion. Did he not listen to the tape, Paul Blitzer? This is what I mean. These people aren't serious. They're just pushing their BS. And he's so stupid. He's like the Biden of uh, CNN. What? What? Say this. I mean, Aaron Burnett, who has turned into a uh, complete fraud, phony, and fool. She used to be a big ticket item. You know, everybody wanted her now. Nobody even knows who the hell she is. Good. Listen to how she's attacking Israel with a blood libel to a Netanyahu spokesperson. Just listen to what this POS has to say. Cut nine, go. Let me ask you about something that is a painful truth, mm-hmm. and that is the fact that tens of thousands of Gazans have been killed since this began, and many tens of them... Tens of thousands have been killed based on what? Tens of thousands. The first thing should be the challenge. Where'd you get that number from? She doesn't know anything. Why doesn't she bring on the gentleman I had on a week or two ago? He's not a Republican or a Democrat. Wharton School, that's a pretty good school. The director of statistics and data, the director, one of the most brilliant statisticians in the country? No. Instead, we got to listen to Erin Burnett because she's an expert in nothing. Go ahead. Listen, people. And we can talk about what the numbers are, but that is a reality on the ground. Just the past few days, Tal, we have all been confronted with these images from Al Shifa, right, the hospital. And after the 14-day siege that the IDF was conducting. You know how many citizens were killed there? Not one. So what happens is the IDF leaves. Hamas fills the void. You have about 200 or 300 of the terrorists who were killed in a 14-day battle. They literally shot, there's video of them, mortars into the hospital, but there, this was a urban warfare in the hospital. And I'm going to have a gentleman on, on Saturday again to talk about this. His name is John Spencer, expert, another expert. And she just spews these lies. Go ahead. There were uh, Hamas operatives there and that that's what they were targeting. Um, the hospital's been obliterated. There are bodies everywhere. Obviously, it's no longer functional. Listen to that. The hospital's been obliterated, and there's bodies everywhere. There's not a single civilian that was killed. Did you know that, America? Not one. Oh, she must know that. Go ahead. Um, you say this is necessary to eradicate Hamas, but I do wonder when you talk about inconvenient truths, how does Israel justify killing so many innocent people? Is she with Hamas? She might as well be on the payroll of Hamas. Why didn't she go over to Gaza and say hello to them, visit them, and see what happens? Because if she were in Israel, we know it would happen. It is just so disgusting. Go ahead. Yes. First, I, I'm glad that you said that we need to discuss these numbers because we because we have to take Hamas's numbers with a, a huge spoon of salt, not a grain of salt, um, because what I, I can tell you the facts and the truth, according to our assessment and the facts that we have. Um, and that is that we we eliminated more than 13- she says we've eliminated 13,000 Hamas terrorists, 90 of the Hamas battalions. Uh, and goes on and on about what they've actually done. Mark Levin, America's tyranny hunter. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Let us go to some callers. What do you say? Well, before we do, my buddy Mike Lee posted something that I want to read to you. If I can get to it soon enough. Here we go. And I will. Otherwise, Mike's going to have to send it to me again. Oh, here we are. Listen to this one. So a a man in prison wanted to be a woman, and he wanted to be transferred to a prison for women. Well, in Utah, they said, no, prison officials said, no, and that's right. No, no, we're not transferring you to a prison for women. You have what we call a penis. So you know what the prisoner did, Mr. Producer? He castrated himself. Now imagine that hurts. And by the way, just because you castrate yourself doesn't make you a woman. It makes you a man without a penis, doesn't it? I think that's right. So, but here's the 
here's the kick. Joe Biden's Department of Justice sued the prison for not allowing the man to go to the woman's prison for which he castrated himself. What do you think of that, Mr. Producer? He really is sick. Let us take some calls, shall we? Yes, we can. Let us go to David Springfield, New Jersey, the great WABC. Go! By the way, before I do, Sid, I love Sid in the morning at WABC. This guy, we become dear, dear friends. He's a fantastic radio host and human being. I just enjoy the guy a great deal. He's a patriot, and uh, we text all the time. And just a great guy. Anyway, thanks, Sid. Go ahead. I, I wanted on. to remind you, I'm not sure if you that that um, just Judge Reggie Walton presided over the Libby, Scooter Libby case. Really? I forgot all about that. And did a disastrous job. Yes. Wow. Well, you know, I knew there was something going on there. He's a terrible, terrible judge. That's as it turns out. All right, David, thank you for the reminder. Scooter Libby. Boy, was he sent up the river without a paddle. Unbelievable. Richard, Portland, Oregon, the great KUFO, K-U-F-O. Richard, go right ahead, please. Hey, how you doing? You know, I love right. your bumper music, by the way. That's I'm 67, so that you. you're, you're hitting right on all cylinders on that. It's great. You know, uh, and a, a couple of things real quick. You know, if if I was uh, a woman, or if I, I am a man, but if I wanted to be a woman, you know, if I got... By the way, can we get- stop a second? Can you imagine where they brought us that we have to talk this way? You know, if I was... A, it's just so... It's a nation in such such uh, incredible decline. Anyway, go right go right ahead. Uh, so, so if, if they change me into a woman, I'd probably never leave myself alone. So that would be oh, I'm a heterosexual man. <laughs> All right, thanks, Richard. I, uh... <laughs> Let's go to Barbara, Salina, Kansas, the great KZRG. How are you? I'm fine. It's it's Galena. Oh, Galena. It says Galena. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, gosh, I wanted to talk to you forever. Uh, you. I admire everything you do. You're like a great history teacher every day. Thank I just you. turned 70 yesterday, and I I can't believe the country we're living in now. But my question to you is this. There's many. I wanted to talk about Israel, which is very important to me. But first and foremost, don't people that run for president take the oath of office and swear to uphold our Constitution from enemies, both foreign and domestic? In fact, they cannot enter the Oval Office unless they do exactly that. And for a president, it's in the Constitution itself. Yes. Thank you so much for that. But I feel like he's committed high treason. I and agree with all you. of his cohorts in crime. And that's it, part of the problem. Uh, whenever impeachment's talked about, you have a bunch of uh, rhinos in the Senate. Saying, oh, we can't do that. We barely have a majority in the House. A couple of guys resigned and made it almost impossible to do anything. Um, as an institution, the Republican Party is, is, is problematic. It needs to have a lot more strength. It needs to have a lot more statesmen. It needs to have a bigger purpose. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway, go right ahead. We keep getting rhinos. I agree. Because we believe them when they're running. And then we vote them in and we discover they're really not mm-hmm. conservative. Well, McConnell's been really he's the longest. He's the longest serving leader of either party in the history of the republic. And you have to ask yourself, I mean, there was Dirksen, who was unbelievable. People didn't always agree with Bob Dole, but he was a fantastic leader. Uh, I can go down the list. Um, McConnell's not that, but he says he's going to run for re-election, you know, to save us from our, own, from our own party. All right, Barbara, anything else? Yeah. 
I don't know if I'm allowed to say this because I've Uh-oh. never I've never heard anyone say it. It's not it's not cursing. Um, my Bible says those who protect Israel, I will bless and those who harm her, I will destroy. Well, you know, Barbara, that's because you're a faithful Christian. And when you look at CNN and MSNBC, do you see any of that? No. Now they're attacking what they call Christian nationalism. That is, Christians who are patriots. So they're attacking Christianity. They're attacking Judaism. They're defending Hamas. These are sick people on these networks. These corporations uh, must agree with them, the boards of directors. They're not cleaning up this mess. And so the media in this country literally represent Washington, D.C., and reprobates in New York City and L.A., and not even all the people there. The vast majority of the people in the country, the last survey was done, I think, last week, 79 or 80 percent support Israel. But we don't have any power. It's the people who run the bureaucracy. You've got Joe Biden, who's who's running foreign policy like a uh, tin pot dictator. He doesn't even bring Congress in, and Congress doesn't seem to give a damn. He's completely changed our foreign policy for the worse. He's completely changed our relationship with the state of Israel. He's funding Iran and the other terrorists while he's attacking the state of Israel and trying to depose their elected prime minister. And we got to hear lectures about tyranny and dictatorships when we're living it and we're seeing it right there in the White House and in the Democrat Party. It's, it's, it's appalling. Barbara, I want to thank you, my friend. God bless you. You sound like a lovely lady. Should we keep going? I think I will. Let's go to Luke, Orem, Utah, Sirius Satellite. Go right ahead, Luke, home of Mike Lee. Go. Uh, oh, hi, Mark. Hey. Um, so we know Trump is an, you know, an effective action person, a uh, man of action. That's what they hate about him, by the way. Right. If he just and sat there like typical rhino Republican, like a bump on a log, they wouldn't have a problem with him. But he's serious about his love of country. Oh, and we know he's a great leader, but what I'm curious about is if he was to read or hear some of the writings of Burke, would he deeply understand them sort of the way that some of some of us understand it and the way our founders would have understood it? Let me, and, t- let me tell you a little secret. When he was president one day, I, my wife and I, were invited to the White House to see the president and to talk to him about something. And that happened on occasion, not often. And he was in the ante room, or the anti-ante room, whatever it is, next to the Oval Office. You know what he was doing in there? He was reading. He was reading. Not a newspaper, not a magazine. He was reading a book. A real book. So to answer your question, he's not going to quote Edmund Burke and that sort of thing. But if he read Edmund Burke, and maybe he has... I think it identify with him 100%. But what's even more important to me is not that. What's more important to me that he instinctively understands Burke. What did Edmund Burke read to write his treatises? I don't know. I don't know. But Donald Trump comes to this from experience, from love of country. And now he comes, if God willing, we can get him elected again with the most important of experience, which is Washington experience, so he knows how to fight these bastards. Thank you for your call, my friend. I appreciate it. A lot of people have read Burke who sit on their butts and don't do anything. So uh, there you have it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Let's see here. I'm going to take a couple more callers. I've had a lot of good luck with callers lately. All right, here we go. Let us go. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, we're not going to go to caller four, Mr. Call Screener. Let's go to Steve, Maui, Hawaii, on the Mark Levin app. Steve in Maui, Hawaii. How are you, my friend? You should be very happy. I am very happy, Mark. I love what you do. Thank you, buddy. Um, I'll get right to it, man. Seems like seems like everybody's uh, compromised on their positions. They say seems like seems like they're just not following the rules, and it's just all going to 
heck in a handbasket, so to speak. I just, I mean, I, I don't know how, how, how this works when the people that are supposed to police them are not policing them. It's like they're all on the same team. And it's kind of like when I was a kid and I thought, wow, why doesn't the government just do whatever they want? And then I listened to you and kind of, heard that, well, there's separation of powers, everybody wants their own thing, so then they're going to want to keep that, and that made a lot of sense. Right, let me slow you down before you jump off the roof. I don't disagree with your concerns here, but there are tens of millions of us who think the way we do. It's just that we don't have much power right now. The part of representative government is being denuded into this permanent bureaucracy, into these judges, many of whom are left-wing Democrats in black robes, and a president that issues executive orders uh, left and right like he's some kind of potentate. And this is the problem. And, you know, when John Adams talked about it, he wrote extensively and he said, uh, you can't have freedom without virtue. And once a nation or a people have lost their virtue, they will lose their freedom. And the Constitution was the most brilliant, co- brilliant construct by some of the most brilliant men ever to meet in one place. In a five, five and a half month period, they came up with this document that recognized a number of things. Number one, mobocracy, pure democracy is tyranny. Number two, centralized government, whether a monarch or an emperor, is tyranny. Number three, as Thomas Jefferson himself said, most societies surrender freedom for government. And then we have others who were brilliant post-Constitution. We had Frederick Bastiat, who pointed out that the law is often used to destroy the law and destroy justice, in which case the law is used to destroy its entire purpose. We had George Orwell in the last century, uh, who wrote extensively, as you know, 1984, among other things. And he said, democracy, everybody uses the word democracy. It doesn't really mean anything. Tyrants use the word democracy. So we're confronting a problem that every uh, relatively free society is confronted. There haven't been many of them. Athens could not overcome it. Rome could not overcome it. And of course, time will tell whether we can overcome it, despite our best efforts by the framers of the Constitution. And I have to be honest, right now it's looking pretty bad, but we never give up. We've had situations where our backs were against the wall as individuals and as a country, and we came back, and we survived, and we thrived. Never, ever, ever give up. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, our truckers. We're with you guys. We definitely are. Freedom fighters all over the world. And yes, that includes Ukraine. God bless you people. And our brothers and sisters in Israel, we have your back, whether the Hamas administration and American media do or not. See you tomorrow.